pleasure to be talking to you. Um, maybe uh, can you say a little bit about your specialization in the history department, what you do? Well, I'm one of the few faculty members at CU Denver. I actually went to CU Denver and then went up to Boulder to finish my graduate MA and PhD there, but did it on the city, the saloons in the city, where I got a little bit into linguistics and all the different groups and how they would go to their particular German or Lithuanian or Polish or um, whatever saloon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been teaching there ever since, gosh, the 1970s. We're, we're here, we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, the history of Ninth Street Park. Um, can you say anything about the life of Ninth Street Park between 1925 or thereabouts in 1977 when the university um, was, was founded? Uh, what was going on? What did it look like? Anything that you, any sorts of details that you have? Sure, I've written books on Larimer Street and on Denver and focused a little bit on Ninth Street Park. In the, in the old days, and it evolved into a largely Hispanic uh, neighborhood mixed with industrial and tamale factories and breweries, and uh, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city, but it was like a heaven for Hispanics. They had St. Cadgett's Church, which had a credit union, which helped many of them get into businesses that are still going, had the Alvea Maria Health Clinic, where they got health and dental care, uh, had the school, had the parish. Uh, so, so they had a school actually right there? Yeah, was, there was a St. Cadgian mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. right there. All the way through high school, or was it bad? I think just uh, elementary, mm -hmm. and I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure there was an elementary school there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then their health care, their economic care was all taken care of in that parish. The first parish in northern Colorado built for Spanish-speaking people, mm -hmm. and they always had Spanish-speaking uh, priests uh, there. So it was one place where other people otherwise might have felt it was a hostile city, uh, would find much to do. One of our students at CU Denver, Magdalena Gallegos Perez, has done a wonderful article on it, how she grew up there. I don't know if you've happened to see that. No, I but Colorado Heritage published it. Then she did a little book on that, which gets into how that parish was the heart of this thriving uh, Hispanic neighborhood. And did the, I imagine there was bilingual people, or the at least the uh, the young the the children, the, the younger generation was bilingual. The older generation was primarily yeah, Hispanic. yeah, it was bilingual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then where did these people come? They came from Mexico. Um, did they come from a particular area within Mexico? And what was the uh, primary reason for their emigration to the U.S.? Uh, you're doing the Casa Mayan story, I would guess. Mm -hmm and talk to Gonzalez. Yeah, I think his family, for instance, came from Mexico because of the 1910 revolution, all the revolutions and the turmoil uh, in Mexico, and also, of course, the chronic poverty. So many people, for various reasons, came north, and when they came to Denver, they would be directed to the uh, Hispanic neighborhood. You can't really call it a barrio. It wasn't really that much of a slum. Mm -hmm. um, because it was basically, because it was, um, thriving in so many other ways, and people were nurturing and caring for Yeah, I think people were nurturing. You had the parish there taking care of a lot of needs. Uh, and uh, quite a few of those people come go on to become successful businessmen. And Casa Mayan, right there on the campus, is a good example of that. And Mrs. Gonzalez's tortillas smell so good, everybody wanted to buy and get one. That involves into this first restaurant, Mexican restaurant, that welcomes gringos. And once you got in there and saw what the kids doing their flamenco dance and flamenco guitar and celebrating the Hispanic culture with music and dance. And also once you had your first margarita, and your first burrito, all of a sudden those people didn't seem quite so strange because there was something of a chasm between Spanish speaking and English speaking Denverites. But this was a place, Casa Maya was a place for... Yeah, and a lot of uh, people go there after show business, uh, kind of the avant-garde, artsy, craftsy uh, type like that would go, and they were welcome there, so it would kind of be that, hey, let's go down to Little Mexico, have a burrito. Was that, would you include yourself amongst those people who, who would go down for a burrito every now and again? Say that again. Would you include yourself? Would you, would, did you? I was never in on that, no. Um, I mean, we're hearing about it, and I've talked to people like Sam Arnold at the Fort and Old Timers that would go, uh, uh, go there. And I trust you'll talk to uh, Gregorio about it. You know him. I don't know him. Oh. No. Uh, Gregorio Gonzalez, who's of the, the grandson of the family that found him. Right. And he's turned Casa Maya into kind of a little museum. Uh -huh. And when we get through here, I'll, I'll look up his, try to look up his number for you. Right. 
Yeah, this is skipping ahead a little bit, but is that the reason? Is, is Gregorio the reason why you know, Castle Maya, there's, there's a plaque in front of Castle Maya commemorating Castle Maya, but none of the other houses have any commemoration of the Spanish speaking community, and I imagine that he's the primary <coughs> reason for that. Right, I think Gregorio Acaro and others. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was trying to think of the last name is Gregorio Acaro, uh -huh. but his mother was a Gonzalez. Uh, who grew up working there and has great memories. She might want to interview her. Right. She's in her 90s, but very bright, pleasant, attractive woman. Uh, yeah, so I think that helped to bridge the, the, the gap. And, and uh, of course, now Mexican restaurants are the most common right. ethnic group of restaurants. And I, I still think that probably softens attitudes towards Spanish speaking people. Um, and can you can you describe a little bit the, the process by which the people were removed from from Ninth Street Park? What exactly happened, and you know, as many details as you can as you have, as far as you know, how they received the news that they were going to be e evicted, and their response to the eviction. Sure, uh, Auraria, which had become a heavily Hispanic neighborhood, was the place where Denver began. That was the original gold discovery. The original settlement was the Auraria Town Company uh, a month before Denver City. And uh, throughout its history, immigrants passed through there, Germans, Irish, and then the last wave of the Hispanics, and it became heavily Hispanic. Uh, and then the city decided uh, uh, an urban renewal project the Auraria Higher Education Center project to wipe out 169 acres there and turn it into a, a, an urban campus. This had been done in Portland successfully, and it was something of a model there. Uh, and so uh, folks were told uh, we're going to level everything and we're given money, I don't know how much, what their, what their houses were worth, and uh, evicted from the place. And there was some protests centered around the church, the, the pastor there objected, as did others, and if you look at what's now the, the little coffee shop on campus, that had become an Hispanic grocery store, and there's, there's graffiti all over that, protesting, Viva La Raza, uh, Leave Us Be, uh, that kind of thing, that they liked that neighborhood, and they didn't want to be urban renewed. Mm -hmm. So there was, I mean, that was pretty much consensus there, or there, were there groups that were in favor of uh, taking the compensation? and, and, and you know, I don't know. My guess is there were probably some that were in favor uh, of it. But the more visible, more vocal ones were. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't found a record of people saying, it's a good deal, let's go. Right. The protests, whatever protests there were, were organized around the, the church, and that was pretty much the extent of it. But it didn't, I'm, I'm imagining it didn't last very long. It didn't go very far because these people were powerless. Is that fair Yeah, to I think that's fair to say that it, it except for some graffiti and some official protests uh, that urban renewal rolled over the neighborhood as they have done nationwide and wherever there was a, a core city uh, neighborhood of people of color that they wanted to remove, you could declare an urban renewal zone, wipe them out, put in a freeway or a higher education campus. There is a happier spend, as you probably know, uh, on this one, and that descendants of Auraria, displaced Aurarians get scholarships. Yeah, it's one of those students in the history department? Yeah, I've had some, and they, it it's actually works for them. They've actually taken advantage of it. You mentioned a few of the people who tell the story of the Spanish-speaking community, the Gonzalez's and um, a few other people, but do, do you know where these people went um, primarily? Was there any one particular area within the city that they that they moved to? Um, well, the, the St. Cadrigan's, the church, rebuilt out on West Colfax and Raleigh in southwest Denver, which is the heaviest concentration of Hispanic people. So my guess is a lot of them would have moved southwest and probably some still wanting to be near the, the parish that had meant a lot to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but others, I'm sure, were scattered around the city. Mm -hmm. But they would be looking for the poorest neighborhoods, the poorest housing, because they couldn't afford mm -hmm. much else. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, was, is there is there an equivalent <coughs> to St. Cadjian's in contemporary Denver? I mean, there's, is there something like a close-knit Hispanic community within within Denver now, or does that, would you say that? that you know, there are other churches that are heavily Hispanic. Mm -hmm. Sacred Heart, the oldest operating Catholic church in the city, 1879, 
is heavily Hispanic, but I don't think it offers all the services mm -hmm. uh, that St. Cadjians did. I mean, you're describing as a really kind of a self-sufficient community almost. That was yeah, to, to have that, that and to have a concentrated, mm -hmm. more visible hub. Because uh, Sacred Art, for instance, there's blacks and browns, Asians, whites mm -hmm. in that neighborhood as well. Mm -hmm. A St. Joseph uh, Redemptorist Church is sixth in Galapago, is heavily Hispanic and perhaps the poorest or one of the poorest parishes in the city. Mm -hmm. um, it was sort of interesting to walk around the, um, the festival that they had on Lawrence Street um, about a month, a month and a half ago, um, which was a celebration, a 50th anniversary celebration of UCD. And they had an exhibit on Ninth Street Park, or on the founding of the university. With lots of pictures of Ninth Street Park, and no, you know, no mention at all, of course, of the Spanish-speaking community. Um, and then, you know, when you walk around the park, also the history of the store, the history of the history, the this, the way that the university has told the story of its founding, and whether you have any any recollection of that, you know, going back to the beginning of was it? I mean, am I? Assuming too much to say that that, there, that this is a story that's been sort of kept down. The university hasn't really wanted to tell this story. Um, that's the way it seems when you're walking around Ninth Street Park. But yeah, I think uh, you're right that, that that's been downplayed uh, or, or uh, uh, ignored to some extent. Of course, there is the, the scholarships for mm -hmm. displaced terrarians. Yeah. And uh, there's, I guess, the Spanish department still alive, is it? Well, it's modern languages. Mod it? Yeah, that's right. Modern languages yeah. is still alive. Uh, one of the rosier sides of the picture is that that campus is built was low budget. With the idea that, that uh, Hispanics could go there, mm -hmm. that they could afford it, that they could live at home, and unlike Boulder or CSU or DU, mm -hmm. which would be too expensive. Uh, so there is, I don't know the percentages, but there is a pretty heavy... Uh, percentage of Hispanic students there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, okay, I mean that's all. I mean I'm kind of interested in the, the plaques. You know whether you remember the plaques going up. You know the, the historic plaques that. Uh, yeah, I was on the landmark commission when oh, okay. some of those went up. Yeah. There are plaques on the other houses, uh -huh. but you're right. There's none of them that. The only one that. Well, the one Casa Mayans got one talks to Spanish. Yeah, yeah, that was your point. But yeah, she yeah. is really Hispanic. Uh, the, to me, the, we did fight on the Landmark Commission to save that church, mm -hmm. which, of course, is a right. Spanish style, right. a mission revival style, with a curvilinear parapet and the quatrefoil windows mm -hmm. and the red tile and the stucco roof. So at least we have that architectural right. uh, landmark reminder. Right. And was, that, was that a big struggle? Or how, did that, how did that work that you, when you saved that? Uh, yeah, the, the uh, powers of E wanted to tear everything down, and mm -hmm. the Landmark Commission said, how about saving some reminiscences of older area? Uh -huh. So Ninth Street Park gets saved as a historic district, mm -hmm. and St. Cadjus, uh -huh. and St. Elizabeth's the German church, uh -huh. an, an, another heritage that, that could be celebrated there. Right. Uh, and that was in the late 70s when those, those were designated yeah, as Landmark? That, yeah, when they were facing demolition, when Herbert Newell comes through uh, in the 1970s, I think the, the laws get passed in the late 60s, and much of the demolition happens uh, before 1976 when the campus officially opens. Right. Okay. But I was there the day it opened, April, uh, July 4th, 1976, and I can't remember any Hispanic angle or, or story about it then. And I think at that point the Gonzaleses hadn't emerged to say, let's celebrate Casa Maya. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much. You may know there's an effort now to put up some flags. I do, I do not know They're geared more to architecture, I think, than to uh, Spanish history. These flags would go around the campus.